Hi, everybody, and thank you for joining us today. Um, uh, today's webinar is When the Car is Parked, Common Car Seats Challenges, How Many Helping. Um, this webinar is brought to you by State Farm and Safe Kids. We're so happy you're joining us today. Um, this is a community education webinar. There was not enough new technical content for it to be um, eligible for CEUs, so this is good for community education. Um, so you don't need to worry about documentation for community education, but if you are somebody that digs that and just feels like you need it, uh, we've got some directions on your screen. Um, by the end of the day today, we want to make sure that you are um, understanding the importance of a tight installation and some of the tech that Vertex is using to make it easier. Uh, we're going to talk about some common challenges with harnessing and unbuckling and talk about some new products um, to help keep children safe in the car, not in terms of child passenger safety, but to make sure the harness is correct, to make sure that they can get out of the seat, and of course, uh, backseat tools to, uh, and technology to remind you about kids in the back. We have a veritable cornucopia of speakers today, um, and I'm so excited. We've got five speakers, and the first is Sarah Tilton, who you know from Britex. Our second is Dahlia Risk from Buckle Me Coats. We also have Becca Davison from Unbuckle Me. And we have Sarah Haverstick from Good Baby. But wait, that's not all. We also have Andrew Orkin from Clever Ellie. So we've got um, a whole bunch of speakers. You're going to learn a lot about different products. Um, because we have so many speakers, please do questions in. We will do Q&A at the end. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Becca. Great, thank you so much. Can you hear me okay? All right, yes. all right, great. We will jump right in. So if you can go to the next slide, just a couple of slides I have up front to set the stage on what we're talking about today and why we're talking about this. So we know parents are making mistakes. Um, I wanted to share a few uh, statistics here from uh, from NHTSA. We know that this is not exhaustive. We know that there's uh, parents making mistakes in, in other areas as well. But it's really important that we're here, right? And this is why we do the work that we do, is to try to help parents um, ride safer with their children when they take them out in the car. So you can see here some of the, the categories that the blue is correct use and the pink or the red is incorrect use. So you can see things like harness tightness, chest clip positioning. I'm sure these are commonly uh, things that you commonly see when you're working in the field with parents that, that aren't always used correctly. And if you can go to the next slide, you know, as manufacturers, I know we're always looking for ways to try to inform parents and help them learn how to fix these mistakes. And it's not always easy to do that through car seat manuals. Um, you can see that the 61 percent of parents are reading the manual, 33 percent aren't. Um, we have information on car seat labels, on, on car seat boxes and on product labels and product boxes. But it's a lot to expect parents to read everything and they're not always doing it, unfortunately. So um, ourselves as, as manufacturers of products and of car seats and technologies are really thinking about how can we help parents? How do we make it easier for them? If you go to the next slide. How do we make it easier for them to travel safely with their children? And that's what brings us here today, is to talk about new technologies and innovations that are um, available to you that we want to make sure you know about that can help parents travel more safely with their children. So with that, I'll turn it over to Sarah Tilton to kick us off. Thank you, Becca. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about getting a tight installation. Next slide, please. We know that. Um, you know, that's one of the biggest challenges that caregivers have and the understanding of how to lock a seat belt, whether it's through the retractor, or does my latch plate lock? Um, so I'm gonna uh, share a little bit about how Click Tight is helping with this error. Next slide, please. So we know that some of the common installation challenges are, you know, pulling that seat belt tight, knowing that they have to pull it tight, right? Um, as an adult, before we have children, we hopefully know that we reach up, grab that latch plate, and we buckle up. We don't have to do anything else to that seat belt to secure us as an adult. But to install a car seat, as you and I know, there um, should be, a, or usually is extra steps, right? Depending on which car seat you're using and what um, built-in technologies it has. Getting that uh, belt path 
right, um, getting that seat belt routed correctly. Lower anchors has limitations as well. We still have to pull it tight, not just attach the lower anchors to the, or lower connectors to the anchors. Um, and not all seating positions have latch. Uh, and then of course, that lower anchor limit that came to us a few years ago, if you will, because it initially was not introduced in the early phases um, or early years using latch. So with that, we'll move on and talk a little bit about what it is that caregivers are looking for, right? And uh, back in, I'm gonna say 2000, anywhere from 2000, before 2013, uh, you know, Britex was doing research and our engineering team and our new product development team was challenged to do something to make installations of car seats easier. And um, we found, of course, that caregivers want to be able to do it safely and securely and easily with what they have in the vehicle, right? Um, we as technicians want to have this tech box um, at all times with all these supplies. And while it's great for us as technicians, we have to remember that, you know, our job as a technician is to educate so that they're empowered to do it themselves. And when we pull out all these great tools that we have, we still kind of intimidate these caregivers because they don't have everything that we have. Next slide, please. And prior to us launching ClickTight, uh, Safe Kids actually released this study and it kind of reiterated um, to us why we were working on and why we were doing what we were doing. And you know, a lot of people like to use latch and the lower anchor system uh, because it's uh, supposed to be easier. And we just mentioned some of the limitations to it as well. But you know, here in the study, you could see that with the seats that were installed with the lower anchors, 46% of them were still incorrect. Um, and even, you know, seatbelt uh, misuse was still higher than that with the incorrect um, installations or incorrect use of the seatbelt for those installations. We do know that if we can get the seatbelt installation correct, we have a longer uh, use of that seatbelt to uh, have the car seat installed. Next, please. So with that, we brought click tight installation to the, in, to the market in car seats. Um, it is a technology. Uh, you'll see here in a moment that we have offered it and, and do offer it in a few different lines. Next, please. And really click tight is as easy as here in a rear facing installation, uh, three, pretty easy steps. You open the click tight panel, you thread or route the vehicle seat belt through the belt path, and then simply close the click tight panel. Of course, if you were doing a forward facing installation, we would always want to attach the top tether when it is appropriate to the vehicle. Next, please. A couple of key points about installation is that click tight does not require any pushing or pulling to tension that vehicle seat or compress the vehicle seat belt. Um, and that's one of the things that we see that parents don't do now when they don't get a tight install. Um, and this kind of helps them or allow them to do what they need to do with their car seat without these extra steps. Um, and it was really an aha moment for me several years ago when this product technology first came out and I had hands on outside in a law enforcement SUV and I had heels and a dress on. Um, and it was like, oh, this really is that easy. You know, because when you're doing trials, you're dressed pretty comfortably. Um, installation with the vehicle seatbelt is preferred over lower anchors with any product that has click tight in it. And that is primarily because we've made it easy to use and you don't have to worry about those weight capacities and you have a seatbelt in every seating position. 
Um, and the key, if you guys don't already know this, is always release the vehicle buckle before you try to open a click type mechanism. And that's simply because it relieves the tension on the mechanism and it allows the mechanism to open very easily and very freely. Next, please. So back in 2013 was our first line of um, car seats with click tight installation. And the first one was the harness to booster category. Um, this is our current lineup of harness to booster seats. As you guys uh, may refer to these as the um, combination seat that is a forward facing harness and then converts to a high back booster. And then in 2014, next please. In 2014, we brought click tight installation technology to the convertible line, um, meeting a wider variety or a, I'm sorry, a, a larger group of caregivers needs um, with smaller children and make really making that ease of installation available to more families and more caregivers. Next. And then finally, in 2000, fall of 2019, we have brought click tight installation technology to an all-in-one platform seat. Um, again, as you guys know, an all-in-one being from infant, or some may still use the words newborn, but keeping in mind, um, usually they do have a minimum weight capacity uh, through belt positioning booster mode. Next, please. So this is my contact information. Um, if you guys don't already have it, I'm here for you as technicians and instructors, of course, whenever you have um, questions about our products when you're working with a family, um, do not hesitate to reach out to me with any questions, concerns, anything that I can do um, to help you out in the field and help caregivers make sure that they are transporting their precious cargo um, correctly and safely. And then with that, I will turn it over to Becca. Excellent. Thank you, Sarah. You're welcome. Thank you. Yeah, so the next topic that we're going to walk through is around harnessing and unbuckling. And Dahlia and I are gonna take this section, so I'll kick it off if you can go to the next slide. So hopefully we're all very familiar with proper harnessing and what that looks like, no matter what seat you're using. Um, shoulder straps need to be at the proper height, you know, at or above the shoulders for forward facing, at or below for rear facing. We know that there shouldn't be any pinchable material at the shoulder straps. We also know there shouldn't be any twisted straps. Uh, armpit uh, chest clip needs to be at the armpit level and obviously the crotch buckle uh, needs to be secured. Um, we all know this. We all still nonetheless see errors. I know in my experience, you know, going to, to seat checks and, and meeting new families, we know that there are little errors that we can usually point out to parents and remind them um, of things they can do better. Um, it, it's a continual, you know, we always just have to make sure we're reminding them and hopefully they'll learn and they'll do it kind of better next time to keep their children safer. We're gonna specifically talk about um, maybe these last two and especially the fourth one um, as a couple of, of new innovations that can help parents um, travel safer. So if you go to the next slide. So chest clip guidance, I know that this is something, if you, you know, I know it's rampant all over social media or in TV and movies, you always, you know, it's easy to spot when you have a child that has a chest clip in the wrong place. Um, in terms of, of guidance, I just wanted to point out some manufacturers I know include a, um, a little picture on there, and it actually took me a while to realize what that was. It's such a small image, but it is telling you and reminding parents, hopefully, that they notice that uh, as a, every day when they put their child in the seat, they can remember, okay, here's where the chest clip needs to be in terms of positioning. If you go to the next slide. The other challenge that um, I don't know if many of you on the call are familiar with, but hopefully you know this resonates with you, but this crotch buckle can be challenging for some people. And I have seen, and I know I've talked to other technicians as well, that have seen uh, families that come to seat checks without the seat properly buckled, which is it's kind of hard to believe, but there are caregivers out there who lack the strength or the dexterity to push that red button on the car seat. And we've heard, I've heard personally grandparents say, well, I can't buckle it because then I won't be able to unbuckle them. 
And of course, that is uh, greatly undermining the efficacy of that seat when the, when it's not properly buckled. That's that's um, literally step one: is, is buckle your child in it. So, um, if you can go to the next slide, what I want to present is a solution to this. So, these are just a few quotes that that I've had from our company and we've received. So, we know that this is a real issue, um, especially with caregivers with arthritis. So rheumatoid arthritis, osteoarthritis, it does tend to be more common with older caregivers. So I hate to pick on grandparents, but it does seem like a lot of grandparents are the ones um, that I hear a lot of this feedback from. Um, but it can be younger parents too that maybe have carpal tunnel or other hand or wrist conditions that makes this really difficult for them to apply you know, the required nine pounds of pressure um, on the red buckle. Um, and I, I highlighted this quote because I think it really stands out that this is a source um, of frustration, disappointment, and fear. And that's certainly, those are not emotions that we want to evoke, yeah, evoke with parents when they're taking care of their kids or grandparents. Um, so if you can go to the next slide. So we have invented a tool, it's called Unbuckle Me. Um, I'm hoping that many of you are familiar with it, but if you're not, I'm, I'm excited to share it with you. We're relatively new to the market, it's been a couple of years, um, but essentially it's our invention and our company that we, we started to sell this invention, which reduces the force to unbuckle by more than 50%. Um, it is a patented lever arm technology that essentially it's a type two lever, almost like an old fashioned nutcracker. So it wraps around the buckle and makes it easier for those who struggle. So if you go to the next slide, I have a picture of my mom here. My mom is an occupational therapist. She's also a grandmother with arthritis. And we had a very relatable story. When my first daughter was born, my mom couldn't unbuckle her car seat. We went shopping. We realized that car seat buckles are standardized and we weren't going to find one that had an easy buckle for her to open. And, and of course you don't want an easy buckle because you want it to be difficult or not possible for young children to unbuckle themselves while the car is moving. So it's, it's a very logical reason why they're difficult. But for her, you know, she's very active and able-bodied and wanted to take my daughter out and just simply wasn't able to because of her hands. And she's an occupational therapist. She invented this product for herself um, long before we even called it a product. It was just a tool that she invented for herself. And since then, working together, we have brought it to market and found that it's truly transforming the way people are able to safely transport their children because they don't have to worry about being stuck in an emergency and lacking the independence and having to rely on someone else to unbuckle. So if you go to the next slide, a bit about how it works. I mentioned earlier, you slide it around the buckle, um, position the peg over the red button, you pinch the ends together and pull down. You can either uh, pinch the ends with your thumb, because it uses leverage, it reduces the force to unbuckle by at least 50%, um, or you can put one hand underneath and use a flat palm and press on it if, if you don't even wanna use your thumbs. Um, next slide, please. I wanted uh, everyone on the phone, just as your technicians, or as you're out in the field working with families, I just wanted to highlight three you know, key demographics for us that we're focused on of, of who might need this and who might be struggling. I mentioned earlier on the left, parents and grandparents who have arthritis, carpal tunnel, Dacre veins, um, any sort of injury. This is our biggest population is people who really need this tool to be able to safely buckle their kids and, and unbuckle them. Um, a third of, of our uh, customers are actually younger families who have older kids who are ready to have the independence to unbuckle themselves. And I'll talk about that in a minute on the next slide because I don't want you to, to worry about that. Um, it's definitely under adult supervision. Um, but the last market that I would mention is also just moms with long fingernails who may come to your seat check events complaining that they're tired of breaking their nails on car seat buckles. Um, you know, it's great to know that there's a solution for that as well. So if you go to the next slide, I'll talk a bit more on the children because this was actually a market that surprised us. Um, we found younger families buying it and leaving us reviews and giving us feedback that, you know, rather than moving their kids into a booster seat, if perhaps the children are frustrated that they, you know, maybe they're in the third row and they have to rely on the parents, the parents having to crawl back to a third row to unbuckle the kid, or maybe the kid wants to do it themselves in, in the drop-off line at school, and it's, it's frustrating that they can't do it. This is a great independence tool that you can pass back to a four or five-year-old or six-year-old even, who's still in a five-point harness, which is the safest place we wanna keep kids in a five-point as long as possible, but give them a tool like this where they can actually unbuckle themselves and then pass the tool back to mom or dad or the grandparent in the front seat, keeping it out of reach of kids. So it's definitely not something that attaches to the seat. We wanna make sure kids are not unbuckling themselves when the car is moving, but keep it out of reach. And it, it certainly can be a tool to involve kids in the process of buckling and unbuckling and, and help them understand the importance of car seat safety. Next slide. 
As I mentioned before, it does not attach to the car seat, so we never advise that. We, we strongly recommend um, that customers either put it on a keychain. They can also attach it to various places in the car. My favorite on the right here is this side pocket. I think that's the most accessible place. It's always there if you have a pocket in your door um, or if the family does. Um, we do sometimes recommend visor and, and seat back pocket. We always want to make sure that um, you know, it's not going to be a projectile risk. We also want to make sure that if it's a forward facing child, they can't access it. And, you know, if you don't trust them or, or um, giving them access to it while the car is moving, we want to make sure that the parents are very mindful of that. So next few slides, uh, we do have five colors available. These are some of the retailers that we currently work with. We have about 200 independent retailers in addition to you know, our bigger box stores. Um, we do offer a CPSD discount. So if you use the code SAFEKIDS when you're purchasing on our website, um, we are very happy to extend that to our CPSTs that we work with. And then finally, our last slide, just a word of, um, you know, of thanks really to you as a community. I think this um, CPS community has been really fantastic about helping us spread the word to families. You know, you are the front line seeing individuals that pull up to your seat checks that say, you know, I, I really have a hard time with this buckle. You're in a perfect position to be able to share our tool um, with those who need it. So, so thank you for doing that and we appreciate your support. Um, so next slide, and it's just my contact information. If you have any questions, um, we obviously do, um, you know, we're looking to grow our business. So if, if you're interested in, you know, becoming a retailer or becoming a wholesaler, we, we do bulk orders as well. Um, but I am a CPSD. I'm really proud that I got certified last year and it's a community that I'm really proud to be a part of. And we were on Shark Tank last week, if anyone happened to catch us. So there's a picture of, of my mom and my daughter. It's been a lot of fun. So with that, uh, I will turn it over to Dahlia. Thank you, Becca. Before we get started, I wanted to ask you guys to just think for a second, how many of you have been personally victimized by a toddler? I want you to hold that memory for a minute and move on to the next topic, which is the NHTSA and the American Academy of Pediatrics, as we all know, instruct parents to take puppy coats off in the car seat. But the next slide shows that a recent Volvo study has found that 65% of parents continue to leave coats on despite warnings. For many parents, their first introduction to the puffy coat danger comes through the media. In the next slide, it shows that's often sensationalized, like this Puffy Today coat show clip showing parent kids being thrown from the car seat. Due to you guys' work, the child passenger safety technician's effort in education, parents are more familiar with best practices like the pinch test and understand straps must be tight enough that the harness webbing can't be pinched between the thumb and the finger when fastened. But consequently, most parents viewing this clip shown in the next slide easily recognize that the test dummy is not strapped in correctly to begin with. The dummy clearly has a loose harness and an improperly placed chest clip. The problem, next, is that most parents also conclude that if they simply pull their harness strap tighter, the harness will pass the pinch strap test, their child will be strapped in safely and not fly out. What parents need to understand to increase compliance and encourage best practices is both the mechanics of how a crash works and how it affects a child's developing body. Next. In a crash, everything inside the car remains in motion until an outside force causes it to stop. For a child in the car seat, there are three collisions. The vehicle is stopped by whatever it hit, the child's body is stopped by the harness, and the organ hits the inside of the body. Next. In a properly used car seat, the harness should be snug on the child's chest and shoulders, allowing the child to ride down with the harness. The harness is designed to stretch, slowing the rate of deceleration and reducing overall force of the abrupt stop on the child's body. Next, children's bodies are still developing and their bones aren't fully ossified. Their vertebrae is made up of small bits of cartilage which will fuse into bone over time. A great demo for parents is to have them tug on their ears and see how it stretches. Then have them take a second and tug on their finger and see that it doesn't stretch as much. This gives parents a pretty good idea of how children's bones are anatomically different than an adult's. Their heads are different too, making up to 25% of their body weight. So in a crash with a coat on, everything is thrown further forward towards the point of collision, including the child. The puffiness of the coat creates those four inches of space between the child and the harness. The child crashes into the harness instead of traveling with it. And the momentum of the child's heavy head throws their body further forward. The force of the movement pulls on the spine, causing it to stretch up to two inches due to the cartilage. The cord inside the spine is not designed to stretch, and research has shown that it only takes a quarter inch of spinal cord stretch to increase the risk of critical injuries, including paralysis or death. Every parent's worst feel, fear and really, really good reasons to take coats off, but next, 
when a kid is freaking out, those full-blown parking lot meltdowns, most parents give up and leave coats on as observed in the Volvo study. Now many parents think next, but many parents think that the coat, take the coat off rules are too hard to keep up with. But what if the problem wasn't the rules? What if the problem is the coat? What if coats aren't intrinsically unsafe? They're just simply outdated. Next. Parents need choices beyond comply and take coats off or don't comply and leave unsafe traditional coats on. Next. That's why Buckle Me Baby Coats opens along the side and shoulder seams, allowing parents to put the coat on at home, pull the front panel out of the way in the car seat, and easily strap their children in the harness safely with and having the harness directly on the chest and shoulders. Next. The coats are crash tested, not only passing the FMV SS 213 standard, like you'd see in the next slide, but they also passed with a statistically insignificant, can you go back one? But they also passed, can you go back? Thank you. Can you, um, but they've also passed with a statistically insignificant difference between the coats crash test results and the crash test results with no coat. Our coats are, our results are fantastic, but as a mother, I also wanted to visibly see that the coat can be used with the same harness setting as no coat. Our design allows the harness to sit directly on the child, the back is thinner than the front, and there's no hood to fall behind the back creating space. This allows Buckle Me Baby Coats to be used at the same exact harness setting as no coat at all. Most parents, like you, have, have had their share of battles with their kids. Unsafe coats in the car seat should not be one of them. Next. Best practices for parents is the one they will use easily and properly. Presenting parents with options beyond take traditional coats off for safety or leave traditional coats on for convenience decreases the probability of winter misuse. Buckle Me Baby Coats makes it easy for parents and caregivers to strap children in safely without meltdowns because next, winter is coming. Next, here's all my contact info. You're welcome to contact me with any questions. Um, I am happy to answer any of them and I would Thank you for your time, and please welcome Sarah from Good Baby International. Thanks, Dahlia. Uh, and thank you, Becca, for organizing us today. Thank you, Carrie and Safe Kids, for hosting, as always. We really appreciate it. Uh, next slide, Carrie. So I'm going to talk today a little bit about heat stroke and our technology. Next. So we're gonna chat a little bit about some statistics about kids uh, and hot cars. We'll talk about what I think is the really exciting entrepreneurial response that we see to this topic in particular. It really seems to resonate with folks that are very creative and want to find solutions. And then we're going to talk uh, at the very end about the technology that we developed at Good Baby. Next. So probably this information is not new to you. I know many of us have been educating about pediatric vehicular heat stroke for many, many years, but this is what it looks like in terms of the number of deaths from 1998, unfortunately, all the way through this year, as we've already had our first child fatality uh, related to pediatric vehicular heat stroke this year. You can see that we our max has been 53 deaths, which we reached unfortunately in 2018. And last year we were just really close to that. On average, we see about 39 of these deaths every year. And this data, as you can see at the bottom, comes from Jan Null at noheatstroke.org, which is a really fabulous resource if you haven't checked that out yet. Next. So while it's important to know how many kids we're talking about in terms of what the overall scope of this looks like, it's really important to understand how and why this is happening. So on the left-hand side, again, this is all from noheatstroke.org, Jan has broken out the circumstances around these child fatalities. So you can see nearly 54% of these children were forgotten or unintentionally left behind in the vehicle. About a quarter of them gain access to the vehicle, and then almost 20% are knowingly left by the adult. On the right-hand side, you can see the age distribution. And as I'm sure you're not terribly surprised, kids one and under make up more than half of, this, of the child fatalities in this topic. If we add our two-year-olds into the mix, uh, you see it's almost three quarters of the graph there. And those older children are typically that one quarter on the other side that are gaining access to the vehicle on their own. Next. So the really interesting thing with this is that there's a lot of entrepreneurs who have been thinking about this topic, who come up with these really creative ideas to how can we fix this? What can we do? Because we all know, I mean, we are educators. One child's death is too many. So what can we do to make this problem stop? How can we help parents with this? Uh, so I wanted to stop on this 
article in particular, this 10 year old little boy, his name is Bishop Curry from Texas and a six month old died in his area and he was sad and he said, I want to do something, what can I do? So he came up with an idea, he's 10. He came up with an idea and it just so happens that his dad works for Toyota. Uh, next slide. So Toyota is a member of the Center for Child Injury Prevention Studies, CCHIPS. You might not be familiar with CCHIPS, but I encourage you to reach out and, and learn more about CCHIPS because they're a really interesting industry uh, research consortium. Uh, and there's many different companies and manufacturers who have been involved with CCHIPS over the years. And there's many different uh, researchers that are involved. So it's a chance for researchers to learn directly from industry and vice versa. And Toyota is a member and they were able to hook Bishop up. So he got to go to a CCHIPS meeting and actually present his idea in a room filled with university researchers and manufacturers. It was really exciting. So this is a picture of Bishop actually meeting with our director of engineering, Eric Dolly from Evenflow. Next. And while it's really exciting to see people really thinking about this topic and to see this topic not just make people angry, because I know we've all seen a lot of the anger that comes around with this topic, but to make people really think about how can I help solve a problem. However, on our end, we know that these aftermarket problems or aftermarket products can sometimes pose some real challenges for us. As we know, car seats should never be modified and products shouldn't be added from another manufacturer if it's not explicitly approved by your car seat manufacturer. And there's a handful of situations I can think of where some specific manufacturers have approved specific aftermarket products, maybe a seat protector mat that they feel comfortable, maybe they've done their own testing and they're comfortable with you using that with their product. However, by and large, most manufacturers have not done that. So if they aren't telling you you can use it, it's really not a good idea. And we know the why, but let's chat about the why for a minute. Number one, it's more than likely against the product usage instructions. So at the bottom of the screen, I included what you will find in every single solitary Evenflow product instruction manual that says, do not attach additional padding toys or other devices that are not made by us Evenflow, uh, because these items that haven't been tested with our child restraint could injure your child. So that's that second piece to the why. If we haven't tested with it, and it's not even just crash testing, there's all kinds of other testing that we do with our products. If we haven't tested that product with our product, we really can't tell you what's gonna happen one way or the other if you're to use it. Additionally, these products that you might be attaching in some way to something in your vehicle may pose a potential projectile risk. And we certainly won't, don't want to add any other risks that could be not just for that child, but any passenger in that vehicle. Next. But before we get into our technology, uh, I wanted to share, you know, just those reminders of things that we can all talk about with parents that we're working with, because we're all educators out there and it's starting to get warmer. I live down in Florida where it's already, you know, up at 90 degrees every day right now. So this is happening. We already had our first death this year. This is a really good time to start reminding families with everything else on their plate. And this year in particular, there's so much on everybody's plate right now. It can be really easy to see how that change in routine and just the overwhelming stress of life can make this a really challenging thing for parents. So the easy reminders, there where you don't need technology, things you can just do that we've been educating about for years. You can put a stuffed animal in that car seat. And you throw the stuffed animal to the front seat when you put baby in the seat, and that's your visual reminder up front. Hey, the baby's in the seat. You could leave your shoe in the back seat with the baby. Presumably, you're not going to walk too far away from that vehicle with only one shoe on. Uh, so you've got that as your reminder. Uh, per personally, I use number three a lot. So when I had my first child eight years ago, uh, I would put reminders on my Outlook calendar. I worked at a children's hospital, as I'm sure many of you do. I was running our injury prevention program. I was running around like a crazy person half the time, but she went to childcare on campus. So I was always the one dropping her off. But there were certainly days that I wasn't going to be on campus first thing in the morning and my husband was going to drop off. And not that I didn't think he loved her as much as I did, but because I know that is not his route to work. That is not what he does every single day of the year. I would in advance add a little reminder to my Outlook calendar and give him a call 15 minutes after I dropped, after I expected him to have dropped her off to just say, hey, what's up? How did how drop off go? Did she cry? Was everything good? Uh, just to check in and just gave me some peace of mind while I was out doing whatever I was doing. And that reminder popped up on my phone. So it was right there. I didn't have to remember myself that morning because it was already in the Outlook calendar for me. 
And certainly, because I'm talking about a child care drop-off situation, have that discussion. Encourage caregivers to think about who are those other caregivers that will be with your child and have this discussion with them. If you're dropping off a child care every day, does the child care center have a policy where they would get back in touch with you if your child hasn't arrived at a certain time every morning? So these are really important to topics that I think we need to bring up as educators when we're having that appointment with families and make sure we're reminding them about these op options and these opportunities. Next. And now I'm going to take the little bit of time I have left to tell you about the technology that we created with Good Baby. Next. And I say we created, but we were actually approached by an outside design firm that had developed this technology. One of those really cool entrepreneurs that I talked about in the beginning that had a really good idea and had this technology, but knew they needed a partner and knew they needed a car seat manufacturer that was willing to step in. What we liked about it was that it was a really simple design without a complicated user interface, and it was compatible with a wide range of vehicles. And really importantly for us and for you guys as car seat educators, we know this, there's so much misuse. There's no change to basic car seat usage when we're using this product. And for us, that was really important. We know this is complicated. We didn't want this to do anything to the installation of the product or the harnessing of the child. And most importantly for all, we knew this was the right thing to do. If there was something that we could add that was relatively inexpensive, that could really make an impact and provide this reminder notification to families, we felt like that was really the right thing for us to do. Next. So this is sensor safe and this is what it looks like. You'll find it on Cybex products and on the Evenflow Gold line of car seats. Uh, this newer iteration, so we launched this like five or six years ago and this is our latest iteration of it. It comes with Bluetooth technology, which is how we now have a free sensor safe mobile app. That app is iOS and Android compatible. The only thing about this that is just a little bit different than using your car seat is that we have this receiver plug. That's what you see in that second image on the left. Uh, that gets inserted into the vehicle's OBD2 port. At the end, I'm gonna show you a couple images of what that OBD2 port looks like, but that's the only piece that's a little bit different. You plug that in and then you just use the car seat and you harness your child the same way that you would do that all the time. The technology is incorporated into that chest clip that is already on the product. So at that point, once you start driving, that's when everything starts to talk to each other. So let's pretend we're going to the grocery store. We're driving down the road, we're headed to the grocery store. You get to the grocery store and you cut off your vehicle ignition. Within a couple of seconds, you're gonna hear a series of reminder tones if your child is buckled in the back seat. So that's just your reminder, hey, that chest clip is buckled, so we think there's a kid in the back, go check the back seat. So you hear that every time the child is buckled in the back. Additionally, if you were in that car, you're headed to the grocery store, maybe your child's a little bit older and maybe they're a little bit curious and they've unbuckled that chest clip while you're driving. You're going to hear that tone again while you're driving to alert you to the fact that that chest clip is now unbuckled. You need to hopefully safely pull over and figure out what's going on in the back seat. Those two notifications you receive inside the vehicle. So that little receiver plug has a speaker and it's going to play those songs from inside the vehicle. So even if you choose not to use the app at all, you're going to get that notification inside the car. But then if you want, you can use the app and you'll get those notifications as well as a few others. Next. So this is what some of the app screens look like. Uh, you can actually create an account, but you can actually create a little family. So I'll talk about that in a few minutes because that's a really interesting component to this. Obviously, we hope that consumers will enable the critical alerts. So that would be the reminder that the child is in the car and that chest clip opening notification. And then the app walks you through setting up the technology. So connecting that receiver plug inside your vehicle and connecting your car seat. And you can have multiple car seats in the vehicle that are equipped with sensor seat. So those chest clips are each individually, like they're individually recognized by that receiver. Uh, so you could have multiple back there and you would know which notifications are for which chest clip. Next. Also, the app allows us to give you some more information. So if you're using the app, you have access to manuals and FAQs. And the cool thing about an app is it's something that we are constantly updating and we're pushing through uh, new updates and we're clarifying new information. So it's something that we can constantly change and doesn't require the consumer to buy anything new to get new information. We can just push new updates to the users of the app. 
On the right, you can see adding a family member. Uh, this is the emergency contact notification in the app. So if you want, you can add a family member, a neighbor, a friend, somebody that, you know, is close with you that you would want to have notified in the event of an emergency. So how this would work, say we went to the grocery store again and you hear the notification in your vehicle, but you're really busy and, and maybe you're chatting with somebody or you're doing something else and you walk out of that vehicle and now you walk away from the vehicle. So you didn't go to the back seat. You didn't take the child out. So you didn't unclip that chest clip. So now we've got a child and a chest clip in the back seat of the car and you're walking away from the vehicle. At the point that you break Bluetooth connection with that vehicle, you're gonna get additional pop-up notifications on your phone and the emergency contact your family members that you've set up inside the app will also get notifications. Next. So the notification on the left is the notification that you would see. This child is alone in the car, and you can see in this case, this child is Michael. That's who was assigned that chest clip. And it's going to give the last known GPS location for that vehicle. So that's what your emergency contacts would also see. If you've stepped away, other people will be alerted to that. So even if for whatever reason, you're not seeing this on your phone and you're not getting that message, somebody else is getting that message for you. In the center, you can see what the notification looks like when that chest clip is open. Again, that's another one that you hear in the vehicle, so you don't need to be looking at your phone. You're gonna get that inside the vehicle. And then on the right, we take the ambient air temperature around the chest clip, so we can give you temperature, hot or cold notifications as well. Next. In case you're not familiar with an OBD or onboard diagnostic port, uh, this is what a few of them look like. Uh, you can generally find this underneath the dashboard on the driver side of the vehicle. Inside the app, we give you some more information as well about how to find that in your particular vehicle. Next. So with that, I just wanna say thank you so much for everything that you do. And again, it's getting hotter outside. I know this is not a topic that we always talk about, but it's such an important topic. So if you can build this into the education that you're giving families, remind them that this is a topic that they really should be thinking about, even if they think that this could never ever happen to them, really try to share those messages uh, in your education to help families think about this topic before it's too late. Next. And that's my contact information. I'm pretty sure you all know how to get in touch with me. So I'm gonna turn it over to Andrew from Clever Ellie. Thank you, Sarah. Hi everyone, I'm um, Andrew from Clever Ellie and I'm actually based in Australia. Um, uh, it's good, it's great to see that you guys are doing a lot of uh, work on um, hot car deaths in America. And um, we really uh, try to follow what you guys are doing. But uh, here in Australia, we suffer from the exact same problem, uh, but unfortunately, people are not as outspoken and uh, there's a lot of big stigma around it. People are in complete denial about the problem. Everyone's really angry. Uh, there's a lot of backlash from the community. We can see that on our Facebook uh, comments get really, really nasty. Uh, people uh, go as far as saying that kids deserve to die because it's like natural selection and things are absolutely horrible. Uh, so most of our sales, um, come from America, almost 95% of sales come from America. But um, it's driving us even more to resolve this problem from a different angle. So we're trying to, next slide please. Um, we're trying to address this problem uh, with society and kind of trying to introduce this um, navigating around the challenges of the, you know, the whole baby stigma. So in Australia, with, um, Sarah already covered quite a bit of statistics, so I'll just point out that in Australia we have uh, 2,250 rescues. Um, that's a statistic that we have. Uh, I don't think there's a statistic like that in America. And considering we have one or two deaths in Australia, we see so many rescue attempts. So these are near misses. I dare to say that this number would be 100 times bigger uh, in the States. So these things happen. Unfortunately, when they do, people do not talk about it. Next slide. Um, so yeah, we, we're working very closely with everyone um, involved in this and uh, kidsandcars.org is a fantastic organi organization that's um, driving this, so we try to support them. Um, actually, my story is the same. I too used to think that this is ridiculous. How could somebody forget the child in the car? And when I first heard about it, um, when my wife told me about cases like this happening, I would not believe it. 
until uh, later I found myself driving and it was a really busy day, a lot of things planned for that day. And I almost forgot my son until I realized that uh, he made a sound and I realized that I was completely on autopilot driving on my way to work. And this is when it really hit home and I thought that uh, something needs to be done about this. I, I realized myself how easily this could happen to someone. We often find that uh, there's three stages. Uh, people kind of approach this in three stages. Stage one, uh, when they hear about this, they're in complete denial. So approaching them at that stage is useless. Uh, they will not uh, even listen to you. Stage two is when they kind of had a time to think about it and talk to their friends and peers and colleagues and everybody. And then that's when they realize that it could happen to them. And then stage three is when they kind of looking for a safety solution. Um, next, next slide. So we try to get uh, give people, guide them through the process and get them through the three stages. That means that we have to keep talking to them and keep uh, providing information. Uh, one of the people we worked with really closely, when I found about this issue, I uh, went through to the experts here. Professor Matthew Mundy is the Australian version of the expert who's leading that issue. So he's really, uh, his point is very clear that uh, if you can forget uh, to buy milk and forget to get groceries and forget where your keys are and forget where you park the car, uh, this is the same way that the brain forgets. Uh, you can't control what you forget, basically. The brain forgets when the brain forgets, and it doesn't associate the value of what or the object has been forgotten, so it just happens. Um, so he's, he does a series of really good videos that kind of bring it down to earth. Uh, we piggyback off that, and we, we when we de designed the product, we ran it past him, and he said it was a fantastic idea. Next slide. Um, we also try to do these are photos from our actual marketing campaigns. So we try to uh, cover all the situations and to say that it's not necessarily you. Again, we're never getting around the stigma. We're saying it's not you. It could be your parents, it could be your caregiver, it could be someone else. Uh, we try to cover um, extreme circumstances. We can say that something could happen on the way, and that's usually what happens. I mean, people don't do this intentionally. Um, as you saw in Sarah's statistics, 50% of cases, they are accidentally forgotten. Um, and, you know, we're trying to prevent these things. Um, and we rest on the data provided to us by um, Kids and Cars. And uh, there's uh, noheatstroke.org is another organization run by um, Ian. And Ian provides a lot of fantastic statistics. So all of the statistics that usually published out there, that's uh, thanks to him. Next slide. So we took a different approach and we decided to modify the cars for that reason. So instead of trying to modify, uh, create a device that senses the baby, we're trying to modify the car and teach people to build that habit. And actually that was uh, told to us by Matthew Mundy. He actually said that the only way to fight this is to create the habit. And now uh, this is where the shoes and all of these other um, taking the shoes off and uh, putting the soft toys in the back seats come from. We're trying to teach the parents to do this regularly. They, there's often an advice to get out of the car and open the back door, even if you don't have the baby there, just to keep that habit going. So the concept of our devices, basically, it plays um, a message every time the car stops and the engine turns off and you open the door to get out of the car. This is the time when it reminds you to check the back seat. Um, there's a, actually a real European legislation that's just come out in Italy, I believe, and it actually makes it mandatory for all cars to have a reminder. So this is exactly what our campaign is trying to do. We're trying to push along things like that to make it kind of mandatory for the car manufacturers to have this very, very basic and simple technology. Next slide. Um, it's a really basic uh, car charger. I'm sure most of you have one in the car like this. So we, we didn't want to occupy the only port that people have, and we turned the reminder device into a useful car charger. Um, everyone could use one. Uh, next. Basically, myself and my colleagues flew into China. We found uh, a car charger manufacturer, and we worked really closely with them to put a speaker into it, and a little battery, and a little circuit uh, that uh, plays message every time the car charger senses the car being turned off. Very reliable, very simple. There is no interface, there's no apps, there's nothing. It basically plugs into a car and modifies the car to provide you that warning every time. Next. 
Uh, one of the key differences that we made, we realized that there's a lot of uh, beeps and tones and noises in the car, so we decided to uh, make different messages that keep changing every time, so you never get used to the message. Um, I'll show you what it sounds like now. And uh, next time the message is going to be different. Next slide. So um, we're intentionally targeting not to have anything to do with babies uh, on the device or if, if, if with the messages, there's actually no reference to the babies again for the same reason because we don't want, we're trying to avoid that stigma. We're trying to give people a reason not to have to uh, look for excuse in front of their, co in front of their friends and colleagues. This is just a reminder that has to be in the car. Next. And we're targeting with our marketing uh, the two types of scenarios. One is to not forget the baby, obviously, for people that have the babies. And the other one is to not forget your lunch, groceries, laptops, whatever it is that people leave in the back seat. Before you guys freak out, but uh, this is a photo of my daughter. She's not wearing a chest clip. We in Australia don't have that. Uh, we have a different standard, so we don't need to. <laughs> I have a lot of people comment on that. Uh, next. Yes, yeah, so uh, our story is simple. We have three fathers, three school friends, and um, we really take this quite personally because we all feel very precious about our kids. Uh, and we decided to um, form this device, and then we organized that we're a non-for-profit organization, so all the money that we raise from this go back into the advertising, back into promotion of the cause, and we're trying to educate people as to how quickly and how easily this could happen. And even if you strongly believe that this will not happen to you, that is not um, an acceptable behavior, you still need to take precautions. Uh, and it, we believe that this is a really good habit, a really easy habit to form. So after about a couple of months of using this, you will hear a voice in your head <laughs> telling you to check the back seat uh, when you finish the behavior of opening the door. Uh, we have a really big future uh, ahead of us. We've got a lot of things planned. Um, next slide. So we're, we're trying to get celebrity voices on board with basically the car safety is not sexy, unfortunately. So we're trying to make it a bit more community acceptable. We're trying to get celebrity voices. We're um, actually working on a, a rapper, RJ, uh, created a music for us. Let's see if I can. Yeah, so <laughs> uh, this has just come off last night. Um, yeah, we're trying to uh, get the social acceptance. There's two ways you guys can work with us, and we'd love to hear from people who are like-minded like yourselves and CPSDs um, who deal with this on a daily basis. You can either become our affiliate marketing partner, which has no cost, nothing at all. Basically, you sign up. Uh, we will give you access to all the marketing information that we have. You spread it to your social media, and we'll give you a special link. Anytime somebody uh, clicks for that link to buy the device, we give you a kickback commission. Um, that's non-negotiable. We would like we we basically share our marketing budget instead of us paying for Google advertising, which is what we spend most of our money on. We pay you. Instead. And the other way is uh, some people prefer to carry stock locally, so we offer ten packs of ten uh, at a discounted rate. Uh, you keep it if you don't sell it, you return them back. Uh, nobody seems to return them for some reason. Maybe that's because we're Russian. <laughs> but most, most likely they're actually quite easy to sell. They're compatible with most cars. Um, we're just about to release a new device that's compatible with all the cars. So yes, that, that's us. Thank you. Uh, information is on the bottom. You can contact us. We'd love to hear from you. If you don't hear from us in, uh, uh, straight away, that's because we're sleeping. The time difference is horrendous. We sleep when you're awake, and you're awake when we sleep. <laughs> so, But we usually respond within 24 hours. Thank you. Thank you, Andrew, um, and thank you, all of our speakers. We had a lot of different items today. We highlighted uh, Buckle Me Coats from Dahlia. Becca talked about Unbuckle Me. Of course, we just heard from Andrew with Clever, uh, Clever Ellie. Sarah Haversick talked about some uh, reminders for the back seat, including sensor safe. And Sarah Tolton talked about um, click tight and some of the ways that manufacturers are addressing uh, proper use of harness. So. We have a lot of speakers. I know we don't have a lot of time for questions, but we do have a few. So I'm going to ask our speakers to get ready to unmute themselves, and we will let the games begin. Um, so the first question is from Kim, and this is, I think, geared towards both Sarahs. Um, as car seat manufacturers,
position, or does MACPS, which is the Manufacturers Alliance for Child Passenger Safety, have a position on things like uh, like the buckle me codes or the unbuckle me item? So either Sarah. Sorry about oh, that. Sorry. I had to find my <laughs> I had to find my unmute button. Um, so from a Britex perspective, we would not support it simply because it does have an additional thickness behind the child. Um, but that is how we would we would address that. After Sarah, the second Sarah speaks. I was just going to say, you know, from our end, when I do training with our customer service team, uh, especially as we get into winter months, you know, we have a lot of Canadian consumers, a lot of consumers in the northern U.S. We talk a lot about winter coats and I do the, hey, let's try on the coats. Let's try to harness the child in, then have them not make any adjustments and, you know, do that little test and so then put them back in, see if they're slack. So if somebody were to call us, I would have that same recommendation, you know, test it out and make sure there's no slack when you're using it. And that's generally what we talk to consumers about. Okay. Yes, so I just wanted to reiterate that the back of the coat is thinner than the front. It is not as thick as a traditional winter coat deliberately, so that the coat can be used at the same harness setting as no coat, which is uh, what Sarah from Good Baby pointed out. Um, it is designed to not interfere with the way that the harness would be adjusted if the child would have no coat on. And we have a question. Uh, Marin wants to know if Clever Ellie comes with multiple languages. Um, good question. We um, we are looking into it. We're just really struggling with sales in English as it is. <laughs> we're really trying to hack into getting the right approach to people. Um, but we can certainly make it in different languages. Yes, we're in control of the messages. Uh, it will have to be manufactured in batches. So if, if there is a demand, we're looking at Spanish as the next language. Uh, so the answer is not yet, but we'll, if yes, do talk to us. Um, we do have a lot of questions. We're only gonna be able to ask one more. So if you do have questions, you can click on handouts and download the handout, or we will have a link to the handout and a follow-up email, and you'll see our speaker's contact information in that PDF. Um, we did have a couple of people um, ask about, uh, and I guess Sarah H, this one is for you. Um, are multiple car seats able to be used to the same receiver, part A, and part B, what if a driver already has the um, OBD in use for car insurance? Is there a way to use it without the OBD? Uh, so good questions. Number one, part A, you can use the one receiver plug with multiple car seats. So I think we're actually up to, you can have 16 car seats in the vehicle that each have. Oh my. <laughs> so if you have a really, really, really big vehicle, uh, you could have every one of those seats using one of the chest clips. They're all uh, registered independently. So not only will it recognize it, but it will recognize it as its own independent seat. Uh, and then in terms of if you're using the OBD port, there is only the one OBD port in the vehicle. Uh, so at this point, that's the only option. Um, you would potentially have to choose which one you were going to use between one or the other. Um, there is one vehicle on the market that does not have that OBD port. Uh, so we have a separate kind of hybrid solution for that. Uh, and certain hybrid and electric vehicles need a separate, uh, need to set up their receiver in a different way. So we have instructions about how to do that as well. Well, I am, boy, did this hour just fly by. Um, we had um, great speakers, Andrew, Becca, Dahlia, Sarah H, and Sarah T. Uh, before we close out, uh, do any of our speakers have any final comments or anything they'd like to say? Just to clarify on the question earlier as well for Unbuckle Me, it doesn't attach to the car seat. So I think that um, it's a tool that, again, stays separate from the car seat and should be kept out of reach of kids when not in use. So just wanted to mention that around safety as well. Okay. Hey. Well, um, you know, we had a lot of you take time out of your day to learn about these products. Again, this is the first time we've done something like this. Uh, we're usually focusing directly on car seats and that sort of thing. Um, this webinar does count towards your community education. 
um, this meets that requirement for your recertification for the next two years. So um, this is not eligible for a CEU. We do have a lot of CEU opportunities. We've got webinars coming up. Um, and we also have a bunch of webinars posted on cpsboard.org. So there's a ton of options, a lot of great ways to earn CEUs. And again, thank you for joining us to earn your community education. Um, if you need help, uh, let us know. Um, you can always reach us at cpscert at safekids.org, and we're happy to answer any of your questions. Um, again, I want to thank you all. Thank you for what you're doing. Thank you to our speakers for taking such care in their presentations. And thank you to everybody in the audience for taking an hour out of your busy day to learn with us. Goodbye, everybody, and stay well.